um, the excess estrogen in the human body can lead to thymic atrophy. This is, yep. I don't think many people even know about the thymus, but it's this immune gland behind the sternum that's quite interesting. And it, it involutes as we age, or at least that's the mainstream narrative. Yeah. But it does, it does. But why exactly? Why does it involute? Right, right. Nobody right. has answered the question. And it looks like it shouldn't involute. In other words, it's a pathological process and you can actually reverse it. You're probably referring to that study that I posted, uh, administering aromatase inhibitors can reverse the age-related thymic atrophy. And it was a really blockbuster finding. Nobody expected to see it. Now, the, some evidence was seen indirectly by the fact that administering anti-cortisol agents, and cortisol is truly the primary driver of this atrophy, um, estrogen is kind of acting through the cortisol. Uh, by administering anti-cortisol agents, um, they found out that you can actually at least stop the atrophy. Uh, one of the earliest uh, pieces of evidence came out from people using that drug RU486, uh, that they had actually a much much better immune function and they uh, were less susceptible to viral diseases during flu season. Um, and, you know, but it's not been known that cortisol is an immunosuppressant. Uh, so it's not very surprising they would, they would atrophy the thymus. So what does estrogen have to do with it? Well, it turns out that estrogen actually not only stimulates the release of ACTH from the pituitary, it also somehow breaks the negative feedback mechanism. So normally, when you're responding to stress, right, you get the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis to be activated. You release a lot of cortisol. The danger is gone. And the le high levels of cortisol are acting both on the hypothalamus and the pituitary to lower the ACTH and the CRH, which are driving the synthesis of cortisol. So it's kind of like the mechanism turns itself off, right? Because uh, you don't want elevated cortisol chronically. That's that's uh, Everybody accepts that's not a good thing. But estrogen somehow seems to break that, that that negative feedback mechanism, and it looks like it's capable of entering those ACTH and CRH receptors and preventing from cortisol from going there and basically, uh, you know, uh, using the negative feedback mechanism to turn it itself its own production off. So people with high estrogen uh, tend to have higher than baseline than normal baseline cortisol. Now the cortisol may be again, like I said, in the normal range, but it may not be. Uh, it may no longer exhibit a diurnal rhythm, right? In which case, having, so let's say, higher than normal cortisol still in range, but, you know, according to the PM, the PM range to be above range, that over time will actually lead to thymic involution. And very, I, I think a very good biomarker for that would be to, uh, to look at things that relate to bone resorption because cortisol will shred the bone just, just as, a, as it will shred the muscle. Uh, people that are taking uh, glucocorticoid drugs chronically, they're at risk of osteoporosis, osteomalacia, right? So if you look at these biomarkers, it can kind of give you an idea of whether your cortisol is higher than normal. And those biomarkers correlate very well with the, uh, with the basically the level of thymic atrophy. Animal studies have shown that administering progesterone, which happens to be a glucocorticoid antagonist, uh, selective though, sometimes it can fill in for cortisol's effects, it can actually reverse the thymic atrophy, uh, in rodents. Um, and, um, uh, Several studies now recent show that progesterone, uh, that women are at much lower risk for COVID-19. And when they have it, they actually have a much less severe version. So they said, well, it must, the androgens must be bad for men and the, the estrogens and progesterone must be protective for women. So they did these trials and they had several arms, thankfully, not to muddy the waters. They had a, an arm with just progesterone and an arm with just estrogen, right? And all of the estrogen arms have so far been terminated early, which means usually an indication that it made the condition worse. The progesterone arms are still ongoing. Now, no word on yet whether it's effective, but the good news is it's more effective than estrogen, or at least not non-harmful, right? And then older, other older studies notice that if you give anabolic steroids to animals, um, uh, the ones that cause thymic involution are invariably the ones that are capable of aromatization, in other words, raising, raising estrogen. So it's really a, estrogen through its breaking of the negative feedback mechanism on cortisol that ultimately causes the atrophy of the thymus gland, while simultaneously increasing the production of immature white blood cells. And if this mechanism gets out of control, you essentially get the various uh, hematological cancers, leukemias, lymphomas, right? Um, and now they're trying, There's, I think there's a clinical trial with tamoxifene, which is a selective estrogen receptor modulator, mostly antiestrogenic, to see if it can actually treat it. And the drug RU486, which is even though it's progesterone antagonist and cortisol antagonist, it also has anti-estrogenic effects because it's structurally very similar to progesterone. There are several studies out there, case studies, uh, case studies, not, not big ones, showing rapid and complete remission of several different highly aggressive leukemias and lymphomas. 
So really, estrogen is kind of like the if you're in danger, if you're if you're injured, estrogen is the the mechanism that kickstart the production of new tissue, kind of like fill in the void and like create and fill in the wound, right? But that has to be turned off. If it's not turned off, then we get into this state of differentiated growth, which eventually, uh, because you know, if it gets out of hand, it's it's cancer. Isn't there some evidence that desiccated thymus also can help with yes. oh, re- yeah. replenishing the thymus gland, which is wild? Like this is interesting to me because. At, at Heart and Soil, we make a supplement called Histamine and Immune, which has desiccated thymus in it. Yeah. And I mean, having a thymus that is getting stronger is that can that's probably good for your immune system. So, whenever I see that a desiccated organ um, or a fresh organ, I mean, I, I asked the butcher to bring me some thymus this week. I'm crossing my fingers that I'll get some. Like that's interesting. I'm going to start eating thymus more often, Georgie. Have you ever? Have you? Do you eat thymus much? Well, uh, not much, but I eat it when I can because it's not a gland that's usually available at the butcher unless you ask for it, right? Yeah. Uh, oftentimes they, they use it for dog food and cat food. And, you know, sometimes they give you kidneys and liver that that's usually as, as, as far as they go in the big city. <laughs> but now I've started to ask for heart, you know, for kidneys, uh, you know, sometimes for intestine. Uh, if you look at the indigenous culture, they usually consume the entire animal. Oh yeah. They, they're, they're not necessarily going for the lean meat. I mean, they it almost, sometimes they actually, in some cultures, they give it to the dogs and they themselves keep the organs, brain, tongue, right? All of all of the in, individual glands. So back in the day before they, they, we had the isolated steroids or whatever uh, the beneficial factor is in those glands, using desiccated glandular extract from many different glands was the way to go. Like if you had like a fertility problem, uh, a male, they will give you like uh, ground up testicles. If you had a liver problem, you know, they'll give you like desiccated liver. Obviously thyroid, very popular. But for some reason, the only the thyroid thing that they kind of caught up as a medical drug. Um, and I don't know of any other company that's explored producing, like, let's say, desiccated liver extract for, like, I don't know, alcohol liver disease or anything like that. It would be super fascinating. I almost, I don't know how I feel about it because I don't know if I'd want the FDA to regulate it, you know, because then, <laughs> yeah, then you no. can't, then, <laughs> then, yeah, then people can't get it. I think that, you know, if you have issues with your liver, you should eat liver fresh or desiccated. And this has been so interesting. I mean, and I've seen studies on brain that like desiccated brain helps with cognitive decline. And when they tried to replicate the effect, they thought it was phosphatidylserine. And so they used a plant-based phosphatidylserine. It didn't have any effects on the yeah, brain. Right. There's something else in desiccated brain that helps. And um, I, I mean, think I know what it is. Did you What's see that? the recent blog post? I think I know what the factor is, at least one what of them. You, what do you think it is? Uh, the uh, recent study that I posted showing that the cells preferentially accumulate pregnenolone at a concentration several hundred times higher than what's in the blood. And I the highest that. concentration of pregnenolone is in the brain. Uh, so it's definitely, it, it's now known that pregnenolone has a promnesic effect. Uh, there, there are several rodent trials, uh, rodent studies with like the uh, Alzheimer version in rodents, right? Um, it worked very well. Um, now let's see. There's now actually a clinical trial for Alzheimer's with the pregnenolone. So let's see, let's see if it works. But I, it's it's probably not only that. The brain is a huge stereogenic organ. Many people don't think of it as as such, but it really produces and accumulates probably the largest amount of steroids out of any other organ except for the specialized ones. Such as if you want testosterone, you probably have to eat the gonads and the heart. And people say, well, why the heart? Well, the heart is a muscle. We know that cortisol is bad for the muscle. And the heart is a crucial muscle that the body will probably sacrifice the last before it, you know, before you die. So yeah. the, there must be a factor in there that protects when a person is under chronic stress and cortisol is high. Because these people, uh, the heart is usually held until the very last minute. Even in a cachectic patient, their their muscles are long gone, right? So that factor seems to be at least one of them seems to be testosterone and probably something else. And testosterone is a cortisol antagonist. So so yeah, so these organs have. And it's probably not the only factor. It's probably multiple peptides that we don't even know about yet that are there. Uh, and those basically, if you try to isolate them and make them into a drug, they have to be injectable. It's the fact that there's, when you're eating the organ, there is such a high amount that some of it absorbs when you're eating it, right? Not all of it, but enough to make a benefit. And if you try to isolate, then you have to turn into some kind of injection, which automatically limits its access to like vast majority of people because you have to go to the doctor, right? You have to get injected and many people don't like that. It's super fascinating. I mean, this is, it's a really interesting thing. Eating organs is definitely something I'm fascinated by. And when we did the testing on the testicle, the desiccated testicle at heart and soil, lo and behold, it has androgens. It has a bunch of different naturally occurring androgens in there. So, and they seem to be bioavailable. And I've heard you talk about the fact that if you're eating the, the an oral steroid, whether it's pregnenolone or progesterone or testosterone with like long chain or, or medium chain saturated fats, it probably helps it bypass liver metabolism, and maybe makes it more bioavailable. I heard that right, right? Correct? 
Yeah, so so uh, it, it, I always found it funny that the, you know the the blogosphere says, oh, uh, DHEA and maybe pregnenolone preg- are bioavailable when you when you take them orally, but if testosterone, you know, progesterone, all these others somehow are miraculously not bioavailable. Well, how come they're not that different, right? I mean, the DHEA is an androstane; it's a nineteen carbon um, uh, steroid, so, same as testosterone, same as dihydrotestosterone, right? So if one of them is bioavailable, why is it, why aren't the others? And if you look in the literature, you'll see that, that it's been long known that steroids are bioavailable. They're lipids. Uh, the only question is, that when you absorb them, and they do absorb very well, how much of that gets sent to the liver, which, of course, will process a lot of them, and actually accumulate, not necessarily excrete. It will accumulate. So that's why liver is a good source of steroids. Um, and then how much will it release in the bloodstream? So if you want most of, it, most of it, obviously, to be released in the bloodstream, you have to bypass the liver, as you mentioned. And there's this lymphatic transport, which basically dumps them through the thoracic duct, I think it's called. Mm-hmm. So when you absorb from the intestine through the lymphatic system, they this whatever is absorbed to the lymphatic system does not go into the portal vein, which may, and the portal vein drains into the liver. So it means you're bypassing the liver, and then whatever gets absorbed in the lymphatic system, most of it goes into the uh, systemic circulation. And very old studies, when they were still studying, you know, the lipid absorption and what absorbs and what doesn't get absorbed, notice that um, fats with uh, chain length of twelve carbons or less. Um, tend to go mostly to the portal vein, but you know, and, and I think the cutoff is about eight. So anything less than eight will probably get mostly to the portal vein. Between eight and twelve, you'll get up like half and half. Anything higher than twelve, actually, even preferably fourteen, you're getting about eighty-five to ninety percent going to the portal. I'm sorry, to the lymphatic system, which means that if you mix the steroids um, with these longer chain fatty acids, most of those, most of that steroid will actually go into your bloodstream. And now there are several companies on the market. Uh, all, they propped up in the last couple of years that are now releasing, and they already have it approved, uh, oral testosterone fr- formulation. First, they only have the wow. testosterone esters, testosterone undecanoate, which is the 11-chain uh, saturated fatty acid. But that one, they thought it wasn't well absorbed well enough. So now they have it in peanut butter. So they're using this, these principles, but they're using the wrong fat. <laughs> How about they use stearic acid? Like, let's put it in beef tallow butter. or... Yeah, butter. <laughs> yeah, butter. Yeah, yeah. Can you imagine if we put testosterone in butter? That would be the best-selling butter that anyone... <laughs> like, that would fly off the shelves, Georgie. Please do. But you could also... Please. Yeah, you could also just eat testicle or take a desiccated testicle with butter or a fat. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And sauteed liver like, in butter, sauteed testicles in fat. That's that's yeah, like yeah. that's basically testosterone replacement therapy without prescription. There you go. You heard it here, guys. 